Good morning, everyone. Sorry about the. When I got the program sheet, I thought we are going to talk to people who are fresh in their qualifications and uh, little experience. Right? But here it is different. I see all the lab managers, heads of the laboratory, and senior faculty. So it's quite a challenge. What to talk? I used to limit myself reflecting on the experiences, what I have in the last four decades in managing the laboratories. And then to begin with, emphasize the role of food testing laboratories, how critical the role is. Because we are such an important cogwheel in the food safety, totally. My concern for food safety is quite high. Because we see about 48 million get sick every year due to waterborne diseases in India. And almost 580 people die every day on an average and the FSSA already declared 68% of the milk is adulterated and we see E. coli in vegetables, salmonella in meat and in the last 20 years so much of uh, activity on packaged drinking water but how sure we are I am afraid not more than 10% are able to maintain the quality. Now, water is under compulsory certification through Bureau of Indian Standards, but at least I can ask my friends from the laboratory community, can you drink all the bottled water what is certified in the country? Bearing an ISI mark? No. So that's where we stand. So what are the reasons for it? What is our responsibility? What is that little change we can make because we have been doing the same job we are testing for years and decades testing procedures are same systems are same 17025 is under implementation for the third decade so what is that we should do now i wish to look at the challenge in a different angle so first and foremost I would say that food testing laboratories play a very critical role in detecting the contaminations at various stages in the food chain, right from the farm to table process. And we have been assisting various stakeholders, including the regulator. So that's the criticality of the role we play as a laboratory. What have been the food safety concerns historically? I think this should tell us the way forward. So if you look at the 1960s and 70s, I think the concerns were only on toxic metals, microbial contamination. So it was not a complex situation. I think the labs all over the world have done pretty well. The toxic contaminations were a challenge even in the cups and saucers what we use, the lead in the porcelain way. And that was the first bell which rung in United States. Then of course microbial contamination is a common challenge. Then as you move to the 1980s and 90s, I think pesticide residues were discussed at milligram level. And that too only a couple of pesticides, organochlorotestides, that was followed by the organophosphorus and all. Then post 1990s, I think the laboratory started testing these residues at uh, microgram level. And further, 2000 onwards, we have been talking about the dioxins and the precursors to dioxins 
and all the toxins as well. And from 2005 onwards, I think the laboratory started testing more number of residues, hundreds of residues in one sample. And 2010 onwards, even the way testing is going on is changing because we are going to molecular level. Identifying the microbial contaminations through DNA sequencing, pinpointing what particular strain it is, and then profiling them, then going for allergen testings, enzyme analysis, LASAs, and all that. And what is the current situation? Especially thanks to the European Commission's directives and guidelines, the way we test contaminations is redefined. The methods have become very, very rigorous. The rules of testing have been totally redefined. So today you have bracketing standards at the beginning and end. But if you look back 30 years, even 20 years, just run a five point calibration curve and run the sample. But today it doesn't happen like that. To develop a method today, a laboratory needs to invest almost a couple of months time minimum to get that accurate method. The reason is the technologies have evolved so much. As things are evolving, the risk also increases. Everywhere. And we have been dealing with ISO, IEC Guide 25 in the beginning and then we caught up with 17025 and 2005 we are sticking to that. And almost all laboratories are accredited. Still what is the challenge? Why we are in a position not to fully support the food safety chain in detecting contaminations at various levels. So what is holding us? Because 17025 standards, they are good. It's a good system. They capture the laboratory's knowledge in terms of all the documentation. It captures the experience. But still, when I said 90% of the <coughs> What are samples we have? We cannot handle them with confidence. So these systems, in spite of being implemented, we are missing the substance. So if it is an audit, then I think audits are focusing around the quality manual. Nitty gritties are left. So quality manual and various clauses are reviewed, audited and laboratories are being certified and more and more laboratories are getting certified now we have a few hundreds of laboratories already accredited in this nation so this has been not able to support changing the mindset of the laboratories so that's the reason FSSA started talking about good food laboratory practices now we have been hearing about good laboratory practices world over they have been in existence they have been supporting the regulatory data quite successfully. So what's all about? It's all about quality and integrity of data. Now I know there are speakers on this subject in these five days, but I'm not going to repeat the task, but I would like to touch only one or two angles of this integrity issues. Integrity is the main concern. Integrity of data, quality of data. So how do we address this? How can we become more and more perfect in delivering an accurate test report? So that's the challenge. Let's look at these key elements of a laboratory operation that can impact the data and its integrity. First and foremost is the people who are doing the testing, the analyst, their qualifications, the training, and how they handle the samples, prepare the reagents, operate the analytical equipment, how they calculate, and how they document the analytical data. When we come to calculations, most of us use Excel tables where we want to automate. But are the Excel tables validated? 
sometimes it could be one in a thousand, but then they pose the risk. So it is the question of the integrity of each and every step in this process. Then the next important is sample and its integrity. The sampling process, sample handling, the whole chain of custody, right from the sample drawing to reporting and archiving the sample and if repetition of the sample is required, what is the integrity of the sample? Is it the same as what was there in the sampling condition? During transportation of the sample, has the sample undergone any change? Have the environmental conditions impacted it? So all that matters. <coughs> and then thirdly, the integrity of the reagents and their traceability. That's the reason laboratories are insisted to go for certified reference materials of a particular standard. Today, I think the laboratories continue to struggle in procuring quality reagents, SRMs, CRMs. I think that's where a lot of lag is there for most of the laboratories to maintain the traceability. Okay, once we have procured the standard, our job is not complete. We make the working standards and how do we know whether they are deteriorating or not deteriorating? How are we maintaining the quality of these reagents? Sometimes even a sealed bottle of reagent also may lose its integrity if it is not kept in proper environmental conditions. So integrity matters everywhere. Then test equipment. Validity to per intended usage, then their calibrations and preventive maintenance. So I would like to deal with this equipment's integrity more in detail after I complete this. So look at the history of instrumentation, how they have evolved. It was very simple, 1970s, 80s. If you recall, there was a spectrophysics data integrator. There was no integrity issue. Whatever data was produced, that used to be captured like an electrocardiogram. Nobody could change the data. But today, in a computerized situation, you can reintegrate, you can change. Any transformation is possible. So look at 1980s and 2000s, standalone computerized analytical instrumentation. Then you have LIPS. And post 2000, you have a mix of standalone and networked. And then e notebooks started coming into our life. Then, today we talk about uh, client server network, analytical instruments, and even a paperless laboratory solutions. They are just rolling into the market, and some of the advanced laboratories are implementing e notebooks. It's totally a paperless operation. But they are all validated. So to bring that kind of solution, <coughs> even for implementation, it will take a couple of years. So let me walk you through what are the risks in this. In computerized systems, a lot of controls and security features are required. Assign and maintain access rights and privileges. It's a crime to share somebody's password and they allow somebody else to run the equipment. That means we are breaking that integrity. Because if it is a paper record, then we sign, date it. And when it is a computerized system, it captures the time, it captures the signature stamp. And even usage of passwords, there are certain set rules. I mean, you need to use <coughs> alpha numerical and about minimum six letters. Ideally, it's about eight. So right from the password usage, owning it or sharing it, the integrity issues start. So the access rights and the privileges. What happens if you maintain the same password? You are supposed to change your password periodically. And if you forget again, you need to go to the IT administrator to get the new password. So right from protecting the password, the integrity issues start. The electronic signatures specific to the authorized individuals. That means 
if somebody wants to review the data, the supervisor reviews, the electronic signature stamping is taken by the system. Then data backup. Suppose if it is only in the unnetworked personal computer which is capturing the data, what happens if it crashes? Tomorrow if a regulator wants export inspection agency or FSSA wants to come and verify, I mean as a cause analysis for any red alert, how do you verify the data? Data has to be protected. So it has to be protected in the native way the world it was captured. Then define control process for any modification. Sometimes there is a liberty for analysts to do proper integration if required. It's not that <coughs> all the chronograms need to be reintegrated, but there are exceptions. But then whatever we do re reintegration, I think it should be available in the records to verify how we have changed it, what we have changed it. Is it affecting the accuracy of the result? So that means data is very important and especially when the computerization is increasing to such an extent today and it is generating voluminous data. In three decades of running uh, Vimta, we are 32 years now, we continue to construct archival spaces. Today we have more than 10,000 square feet space. Every year it's a challenge for me to find new place to put the paper archives. In spite of computerization, it is still a challenge. So because all these computerized instruments, they generate so much of data, it is not just the sample data. It is right from your intermediate checks, calibrations, QC checks, everything. So how do we handle this kind of voluminous data? So it has become a challenge to almost all the stakeholders. So let's see what data is attributed as. It is defined as facts that can exist in a variety of forms, as numbers or text on a paper or bits and bytes in electronic form. In a laboratory, the facts exist as raw data on paper or as electronic data. It is a result of original observations, measurements, activities which are necessary for reconstruction and evaluation of a test result or project or study report from the raw data. Now this focus is missing in the 17025 because we don't deal with this angle. And in suppose you face any will audit for two days. There is hardly any time for somebody to drill through the raw data and verify how the laboratory has been maintaining the data integrity. Because 90% of the time is lost in going to the quality manual and the surrounding management system procedures, how they are implemented, how the environmental conditions, all that. But at least we are glad to understand at least EAA has taken a lead. Now we have seen them talking about data integrity, the audit trails, the traceability for the past few years. So a decade ago, export inspection agency laboratories were like any other laboratory in the country. But today, I think we are proud to say that they are successful in implementing what is desirable. So what matters is, what is this data, who has done it, when they have produced this data. So these three questions matter. And when we go for a data trail, all these answers must be available. So, what is data integrity? It's a condition which exists when data is unchanged from its source and has not been accidentally or maliciously modified, altered or destroyed. Now, the biggest risk with all these computer and equipment is non-malicious. An untrained analyst, if they by mistake they mishandle the process with the keyboard, they can create risk by pressing a wrong key. So that's the biggest risk. 
And today we talk about a networked environment. In a networked environment, we also use the computer for so many things. So a lot of virus infiltration is there. So how do you handle that? So people have to be trained not only on the analytical chemistry or the biology, but right from how to handle these technologies. So untrained analyst can be a big danger to ensure that data integrity is maintained all through. So to call it simply data integrity is the assurance that data is consistent, accurate, reliable, accessible, and it shall be complete. The last one is most important for a regulator. Because here each and every word is important to a particular uh, category of people. How a system administrator wants the data. Because they go by the access rights and audit rights what it is. So when it comes to a regulator, they want complete data. See, data production is one thing. If you suppress data also is a problem. Data cannot be suppressed. <coughs> So integrity is means 100%, there is nothing like a 99% integrity when we talk about data. So this is highly essential. If you want to remember it, I think there are various people call it as alcova. What is attributable, what is legible, and you write it on a paper record, and what is complete, and then Contemporaries, not complete, original and accurate, if you want to remember easily. Because whatever we do, I mean, we may have a wonderful method, wonderful equipment, great reagents, people are trained in the process. But the way we handle data, if we cannot handle it perfectly, I think we are not going to support the food safety chain as we are expected to do. <coughs> That's about data. But I see there are more and more risks. Standard validated test methods. Now this is my personal opinion. Now we have like methods like AOAC. I mean to produce one standard method by AOAC takes a lot of time. They test it, it is validated, it is used by several laboratories. And then a standard is found. So today, use a OAC method, I think you get accurate results and you can reproduce the result anytime, anywhere for the same sample. Is it true with all the methods what we are handling? We have methods from DGHS, we have methods from others, we have methods in IS. Some are evolving, some are copied. So the wisdom of an analyst, the experienced analyst or the lab manager remains in selecting the right standard method or validated method. Because today, FSSA has given a lot of freedom. It said right from codex you can implement anything. So how are you going to select the method? So obviously, if there is a commercial interest, laboratories would like to follow the most simplest one, less time taking. But if you want to follow a, a OIC method, you need to spend three or four times the time. The process is different. So that's where the problem is. And if laboratory has to develop a method and validate it, there can be a simple validation you can complete in two days. Or method development itself takes a long time. And if you want to do a perfect validation like the way OIC does it, then it takes years. So this method is the real reason to produce what accuracy we can deliver, where human health matters. Now we can directly or indirectly change the socio-economic value of the people, the society where we live in. Today so much money is spent on health care. If this food chain maintains a good quality, safe food, then I think one can drastically cut the health budget. But day by day it's increasing. Today you go to 
Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. You will see once you see the cancer patients there, then you know why people want the contaminants to be away from the food chain. Unless you visit TIFR, you don't know the ugly face of the cancer. But there are so many contaminants in our food chain. So how well the data is produced? So method is very, very important. I think it's an evolving issue. The freedom, what is given by the regulations, has to be used very, very judiciously. And then good documentation practices. <coughs> Legible writing if it is a manuscript and it has to be written then and there. And there is one major risk here. If it is an analytical laboratory, I think you can see the reaction, you can see the sample, people can walk through. But it is a microbiology or any biology laboratory, it's under less surveillance. I think that's a major pitfall. People do the experiment, they handle the cultures, they and in the sample, mostly tend to write the data at the end of the day, sometimes at the end of the week. Then that's not the raw data. That's where the problem comes. And when we talk about food safety, I think in India at least, we have 80% concern on the microbial quality. Contamination is the second because our country is moving from food security to food safety. Still. I think a good percentage of our population is close to or below poverty line. So it has been a long walk for moving from food security to food safety. So microbial analysis is a like a at least here in this testing business. And then the biggest fit foot, I mean the pitfall is out of specification and out of trend and repeat analysis. Now this is not heard much in the food sector, but that's an established terminology used in the pharma. Somehow the mindset is that pharma quality matters more than food, but I, I personally believe that food quality matters more so that you can keep the pharma away. So why is that we want a lesser standard per foot? So look at some of the last year's controversies. If OOS was implemented, I guess more than 50% are from the state laboratories. If any failure sign result is there, investigate the auto specification. Then there is no jumping at the conclusion. Simple example I would like to draw for your benefit is uh, like lead contamination in a food sample. What are the sources of contamination? I mean if you use a cereal material, the contamination could be right from the farm. So is it cleaned properly? So in the food, further food processing, are they eliminated and the clean product is packed and supplied to the food chain? Imagine the product is well handled, but when it comes to the laboratory, what is the procedure? We are supposed to dissolve it in an acid, nitric acid, and then aspirate it in an atomic absorption or ICP or ICPMS. Nitric acid is available in different grades. Analytical reagent, where you pay maybe about 500 rupees a liter to Sopra Pure where you pay almost 25,000, 30,000 rupees. In between there are a few other grades. So are we using the right acid? Because if you look at half the methods, they don't specify what acid you should use. So these are the nitty gritties which are missing to produce a very accurate data. So imagine you have used the right acid, everything is fine. Where are you grinding the sample? If we are using a porcelain mortar and pestle, even that can be a source of contamination if there is a chipping or if the surface is not proper. So today we, are, we have a challenge to do this testing at parts per billion level. I think the entire work environment has to be clean 
we need to use right materials. When we talk about, I mean, we talk about quality of a CRM, quality of other things, but we don't talk about quality of a mortar and fizzle. No specification tells you what you should use in the laboratory. So how do we overcome these challenges? So first and foremost is the moment we find out of specification result, there is a process to be followed. Is the analyst empowered to repeat the sample? No. Is the supervisor allowed to just look at the data and say repeat? No. One has to go through a checklist, verify it, then take further decision and sometimes it requires a thorough investigation where the problem would have come. I mean, laboratory should not jump at a conclusion that the product we are testing is problematic. Maybe our process, maybe our reagents, maybe our training, maybe the equipment problem, anything would be a problem. If this out of specification or out of trend because the laboratory is experienced, the same material is tested over and over again. So we know for each product what are the normal uh, behaviors. So if it's some odd behavior is there, then it's not that we are just going to issue the report. That can have a lot of repercussions on our economy. So that needs to be investigated. So the summary is repeat analysis is something which has to be exercised with caution. And the classical practices are sometimes, you know, we tend to repeat the sample till we get the desired result. That is a disaster which can happen in a food laboratory. We have no freedom to repeat a sample till we get what we are supposed to report. So we need to have sufficient restraint in repeating. I mean, we can have a full session only on the decision tree for OAS, OOT, and repeat analysis. That can be a separate, maybe in the next conference. We can have one speaker talking on how the decision tree is made. So these are the pitfalls. And when we talk about test reports, it's again a ocean. There's a lot of risk. From the market perspective, customers sometimes would like to present the sample to a laboratory and say out of 10 parameters, if one is failing, the tendency for the customer is to ask you to delete that and report only nine results. So that means that this test report doesn't have integrity. One is dropped just because it is out of specification. So these are the issues. Though, I mean, we are supporting the food safety activity. If we exercise the freedom to do what we like to please the customer, please the user, then we end up in giving an inaccurate test report. Because today FSSA says I mean, you have to give objective evidence. So all licensees, they want to have a monthly sample, they want to have a quarterly sample, they want to have an annual sample. When the FSS official goes, okay, they'll have the data ready, but are they showing 100% data? Is the product conforming to the FSSR? I mean, mostly we focus on training, equipment, reagents, quality manual, procedures. But in my personal opinion, I think this is the major problem. Though in the NABL we have a template, how do we report the results, what we should do, what we should not do. What is it? Okay. It is a timer, is it? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so that, that's about test reports. We need to really get into the details of these and do's and don'ts. And then laboratory design and environmental conditions. Today we are doing testing at parts per billion, parts per trillion levels. And if you want to do diagonals, that is at a much lower level, pentagram level. So what kind of laboratory designs are required? Can you handle a dioxin standard in the same table where you are doing other chemicals? <coughs> no way. Dioxin itself is very, very risky. 
when we handle small quantities. I think way back early 2000s, uh, there was a good design published by Codex for trace analysis. So you need a sample preparation kitchen, then extraction, cleanup, and then detection. It is three to four kinds of segregated areas are required. And if you look at the AOIC method, how to do heavy metal analysis, especially the 2015 standard, it specifies very clearly how the heavy metals have to be tested. They would even recommend you have a hood where you handle certain processes. Because we are looking at such a lower level today. It's not the 1980s and 1990s where we were talking about part per million analysis using atomic absorption spectrometer. No. Today I think ICPMS has become so common. So laboratory design and environmental conditions matter. And traditionally why environmental conditions people talk about temperature because where we use volumetric material, glassware, I think the temperature if it crosses more than 2 to, two to 3 degrees variation that can change the volume. But more than that, I think the design and the environmental conditions play a great role. Where we are using a lot of solvents, do we have enough solvent handling capacity? Because the solvents themselves can be a contaminant in some other tests we do. So before I conclude, I would like to throw a, a little light on what are the emerging trends. A lot of green technologies are coming, green chemistry, like we, we have already experienced what is quetchers, where you take a, take a simple centrifugation tube and then process a sample with one gram or lesser, use less solvents, that's a great example. And a lot of green technologies are made today. You have safety hoods which can recirculate. You don't have to exhaust and then throw the exhaust into the town. Because these fume hoods, they can, I mean, nobody is, I think, 99% are not putting a scrubber at the end of the fume hood. You need a separate scrubbing for the acid, separate scrubbing for the solvents. But today you have greener technologies, fume hoods. You can have a filter designed for a particular acid or a solvent which are is your application. So which means that we will not contaminate our internal laboratory space, we will also not contaminate the social environment. And then if you look at uh, all the refrigerators, incubators, today incubators are available with Peltier technology. Peltier technology is what we use in the liquid chronograph yeah. instrument for maintaining the temperature, sample compartment temperature or even Corner temperature, Peltier technologies. The same Peltier technology is there for now for a VOD incubator. So they consume less power, they are environmental friendly, they have smaller footprints. So like this, a lot of greener technologies are coming and because today we are at uh, mostly the nanogram level. But as we move forward, I don't know, this may go to further lower levels because contaminants have become very risky even at such a low level. It's evolution process. As the risk analysis increases and the barriers get tougher and tougher. So we got to be adapting to the innovations what are in place. And then growing demand for microbial testing, allergens. Now allergens can be a great hazard. I don't think FSSR regulations are addressing the allergens. Anybody from FSSR, FSSA? Allergens? Yeah. Are allergens there in the standards? No. Um, we have a lot of data, especially for all our exports. Allergen testing is very common. There is a situation called uh, uh, aphylaxia. Anaphylaxia. Anaphylax, they call it. Even a small allergen, whether it is a, of a groundnut or a cashew nut or anything allergen, gluten, it can drive people to such a life 
threatening situation. We ultimately, when we talk about food safety, especially if we look at the generation, current generation, say children who are born post 2005 or 2000, they are very, very sensitive. So allergens are also becoming more and more common and right now all the importing countries abroad, at least Europe and all, they insist. Is there a gluten or there is a nut contamination? So allergen testing is there, that's one trend. And then shelf life. There are, I think almost billions of more packaged foods in the market. Shelf life is printed. Every manufacturer prints, okay, used before. How are they arriving at? For the number of products we have in our market, I think we require <laughs> millions and millions of cubic feet capacity of stability chambers to really prove and also continue to, to test the stability of product as it is in the market. This is there for the over-the-counter medicines, pharma. What they do, they manufacture, they estimate, but still, whatever is in the market, they keep it in the stability chambers and they are tested periodically, well, first month, three months, six months, ten months, so one year, two years. So if there is a problem, then the product is recalled. So how many times do we hear that a product is recalled in food? So this is where I think laboratories will have a greater role to play in the future because today now we have one decade of integrated food law thanks to FSSC I think. It has been doing a wonderful job. Awareness has been brought in. So slowly things are coming in the clutches. So a lot of objective evidence is there for each and every uh, aspect we talk about food safety. So today, the ent entire capacity what is available in this country is not enough even to support 10% of the uh, testing capacity, uh, the products. We need to create 90%. I think that's the reason listen, the CEO of FSAC has started this workshop of beginning the capacity building exercise. So we need to build the right capacity so that we can be of assistance to all the stakeholders. I see a big challenge. I spoke about so many things. So it took about 40 minutes of your time and talking about all the things which most of you know it. But for me, this is the biggest challenge. At least in the last four decades, we have seen how the technologies have evolved. 1980s, I think we used to expect the life of an equipment to be about 10, 15 years. As they are getting computerized, the computer operating system people won't allow you to sit quiet. See, today you have Windows 10, but most of our technical equipments are in Windows 7. That too, which are purchased last year and now. What happened to the ones which we purchased earlier? And it's not just about uh, signing a check, buying one more and plugging it. We need to validate. We need to validate the hardware, we need to validate the software. And software validation is not that easy. We have to do the same IQ, OQ, EQ. So this is a vicious cycle, outsmarting each other. So today, I am not confident to estimate life of any technology beyond five years. I think there are state laboratories wanting to get modernized and you sometimes, people who are signing for the funds, they say that what is the life of the equipment, is it not ten years? If somebody has to factor a five year life, that's a challenge. But going by the current situation, obsolescence is automatically inbuilt process. At one time, I think, when equipments were purchased by the laboratories, there was no software cost. Today, 
if there is a new version of the software, you are asked to pay for it. And then you are asked to pay for the validation because you don't know ABCD of that. And if you use a in unvalidated software, the risk to give an accurate report is very high. So this is the biggest, biggest challenge I foresee. And that's the reason today for generating a data with integrity, I think Dr. Krishna, you have a talk, right? Yeah, he is going to talk to you more on how to ensure that. Because they are dealing with all export samples for the last so many years. Whenever there is an alert, they investigate and they know how things are happening and how to control them. So this is the biggest ever challenge. It's a continuous process because Microsoft will continue to innovate and technology companies will only follow suit. They will take their own time. And next year they say the model is changed, hardware model is changed, software model is changed. So be prepared to scrap the equipment and be prepared to lend your time to learn these new models, validate them and train our people. Because today we talk about training on particular analysis, follow a particular test method. What is the time we are allocating in a laboratory for training our people on all these aspects? It's very important. So to conclude, I would urge upon all the stakeholders, laboratory professionals to uphold quality and integrity of data in your operations. That leads to a lot of professional satisfaction when we go home at the end of the day, we can sleep happily. We have done everything right in our profession. We have contributed to accurate reports that contributes to the food safety chain. Indirectly, we contribute to the health of the people. <clears throat> Imagine if all the municipal water supplies are tested, health budget can be curtailed significantly. And that would protect reputation more than anything else. Because reputation is important for any professional. <laughs> and today the time has come, food safety has become so important. I think we should all be playing our role very effectively so that directly or indirectly we contribute to the society and the cause of food safety. Thanks for your patience. Thank you so much, sir. So each product is uh, put at different temperatures and humidity levels. Okay. And uh, beginning of you will make a baseline data. What are the quality parameters are tested? Then draw the sample after 30 days. 45 days, 3 months, 6 months, 1 year. So the sample keeps getting tested. So for a particular product category, once that is established, then you have a scientific formula. How the shelf life can be evaluated for a new product. So for each uh, generic composition, I think one needs to get a formula how to calculate and predict it. So that requires, um, as per ICH conditions, you have a lot of humidity chambers at different temperatures. Almost six to seven varieties are required. Yeah. That is still not happening. I think that is being practiced only by maybe select few companies. Uh, maybe less than 5%. But 95% are going for a shelf life based on their processor's gut feel. Yes, sir. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Is there any specific guidelines is there any specific guideline available international level? Internationally, there are established guidelines for the pharma, but not for the food. Yeah. Food only, it is, I think, the big companies, they have their own guidelines and they are following it. But in, at least in India, we don't have any guideline. Because in. Yeah. That is there. How to decide the shelf life period? Yeah. The then the uh, an integrity yeah. and the fixing of the time. Mm -hmm. At what period we should test? Is it depends on the uh, FBOs will de uh, decides the shelf life or the period or any laboratory will decide the period and okay. then. 
because yeah. nowadays yeah. APOs are fixing the expiry date. Yeah, that's the <laughs> no, actually in Bureau of Indian Standards, ISA standards, there are a few examples where uh, it started with Vanaspati and all in the 1980s. So the shelf life studies were done in a very, very miniature way. But in a full-fledged way, they were not handled. I think we need the more regulations, more structured way of handling this. But, uh, the that technical cool. committee members of FSCA, I think, may need to focus on this. Though, so then if we can use the pharma guidelines for the food. They can be adopted and change as required. But that required the <laughs> acceptance, right? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, regarding the advancements in the uh, instrumentation, yes. actually five years back we were uh, talking about the PPM levels. Now it currently it is PPP levels. Now the instruments are coming up with the PPT levels. Yeah. But the real issue is uh, up to what level we have to go regarding the food testing. Yeah. Because a huge amount of money is going in this way. It's actually tapping our money. Uh, we, are, we are dealing with export inspections. Yeah. So the issue is uh, up to what extent we have to do. In my opinion, we should have a national concerns on this regard. That's because true. that means the standards should be specified in that regard. Because there is no point in spending a lot of money again and again in the analytical instrument injection and analysis in PPT yeah. level or PPP level. What is the significance of going up to PPT level, for example, pesticides? No, no significance. No barring, significance. Barring dioxins and certain other toxins, there is no need to go to that level. It's like I give a simple analogy of an automobile. Yeah. What is that you can drive on the normal roads or a highway? Same, same. 80 kilometers, 120, within city, 40. But you have automobiles at 240 kilometers, 280 kilometers, they are made. So analytical instruments also, if you want a triple quadruple equipment, Market sells you top tops, yes. multi tops, all those things. That is their marketing game. Yeah. But we should not be a party to that. I mean, we should select what is appropriate to the regulatory requirement. requirement. Our regulatory requirement should also be yeah. in par with that. Yes. Because there is no point in going beyond that level. Yes. Uh, we see, you know, several marks like IS marks, FSSI on food products, yeah. which ensures the you know which ensures the quality of this product is good. But can we have another mark for uh, let's say that the product is being regularly tested by an independent laboratory? I think only FSSI has to answer that because now at least it's a decade of integrated law. I think FSSI has become one main umbrella to take care of the food. Quality and safety. Testing these yeah. products for once in a, you know, once or twice in a year. Mm -hmm. They are not doing te regular testing of these products. They are giving license. BIS is uh, specifying the regulations. But how, as a customer, I want to know whether my product, the bottle the, which I am drinking now, it is tested or not. It's going to change. I think already it has gone through a lot of education, <coughs> awareness campaign, and then onus is there on each manufacturer to prove that okay, they are doing it right. I think you will see the market change in the near future. No, I think uh, I just uh, supplement what uh, Dr. Vasilide is saying is, I think the issue is of about the self-compliance. Yes. Okay, so if somebody is coming as a self-compliance declaration, uh, the <coughs> consumer should trust on that. Okay, so FSSAI is also looking into that area that in a food business operator, if he can demonstrate the due diligence through the self-compliance, the consumer can definitely can be accepted and regular regulator can give the you know preference similarly for export purpose if the product is being looked after by aic and it goes with the aic certification in the foreign market it is accepted well so need not necessarily each and every consignment and each and every batch of the product need to be tested by the importing country authority that is there okay the earlier question i have overheard was somebody was asking that what is the limit of uh, in the analytical you know Today is PPT, next time it will go to the nanogram level also. See, the issue is we have to see the regulatory compliance. And all the regulatory requirement and standards are fixed on the risk assessment at international level as well as at the national level. At national level, we have the national authorities. At international level, there are the international bodies like Codex, IPPC, and the OIE. Okay. 
but under wto also the prerogative has been given to the individual country if they have a risk assessment they can have whatever the best standard they can have okay now you talk about i am just giving an example the banned antibiotics if the banned antibiotics antibiotics should not be there in the animal tissue it means whatever the best way you are going it should not be there so it depends on the technology how you can do that the risk assessment says very clearly because if the antibiotics is going through animal tissue to the human body then they are developing the immune system against the antibiotics so tomorrow if something has happened then those antibiotics will not work and that is the scientific risk assessment they did and they say those this should be zero and you know in analytical terms there is no zero so you can go up to the n number of decimal places and the technology is being developed for that We are, okay. level, yeah, we are going to molecular level. We are going to molecular level. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Protein. Yeah. I think maybe so, wait for five years. We will be testing only proteins. Yeah. 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 Yeah.